Hey dear listener, this is Dirk speaking. Today is not your regular debating episode. Today is a special. I had the pleasure to talk with Alexander Lorin. He's the proud owner and show host of The Podcaster's Life, a podcast about podcasters. And I talk quite a bit about to debate about how Sebastian and I framed the project, what our plans are for next year, and some more on top of that. You find Alexander's podcast, The Podcaster's Life, and the service he's offering on podcasterscoach.com and on iTunes. I recommend checking that out. It's fun to listen to other podcasters and maybe you get another show into your podcatcher. Who knows? And now, without further ado, have fun with my 40 minutes on the podcaster's life. Hey, this is Alexander Lauren, and you're listening to The Podcaster's Life, live on Spreaker. My special guest today is Dirk Prims from the Two Debate Podcast. I hope you enjoy today's live episode. This episode is sponsored by PodcastersCoach.com. What is holding you back from a great life? What's holding you back from a great podcast? Working with a certified professional life coach is like adding rocket fuel to your podcasting journey. Are you lacking confidence? Are you having difficulty with time management? Are you struggling to maintain your momentum? The Podcasters Coach will help you with all of this, but also help you focus on your goals, provide you with support, cheer you on, hold you accountable, and help you achieve what you desire and deserve. Visit podcasterscoach.com and schedule an obligation-free complimentary coaching session. Have a great podcast by having a great life. I am joined by Dirk. He's a host, a podcast nerd, a project administrator, father, technologist, podcaster, student, climber, writer, speaker, skeptic, works for Google. You can hear him with his co-host Sebastian on the Two Debate podcast at twodebate.net. Kirk, how are you? Hey, I'm doing fantastically well. How are you? Very good, very good. Sorry, Dirk, I called you Kirk there. Sorry, yeah. I've been watching a lot of Star Trek. Forgive me. <laughs> it's okay. To be confused with Kirk is the least problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dirk, I, you know what? I love your podcast. I really do. Where, when did you, where did this idea come from? Um, it had several parents, if you will. Uh, one part of it was that we wanted to do something that promotes actual discussion and exchange of arguments. You know, the Internet these days turns into a constant shouting match where people shout at each other at 140 characters uh, once a time. And um, my friend and I, we wanted to do something where we promote the exchange of real arguments and also the idea that things have two sides. Uh, that you always have uh, multiple ways to, to look at um, at situations or ideas. And that's where the idea came from um, in Two Debate. Also, we are big fans of the, was it, is it British culture? And I think in America they have that too, that, uh, that idea that you train debating in school with uh, formal debates where you actually have to go for and against motions. And we tried to have something like that in podcast form. And thirdly, we wanted to do something that's not out there yet. So find a format that's um, that's new, that's unheard of. And most people, uh, well, so far, everyone told me that we are pretty unique in the setup of the podcast. Yeah, I, I loved it. And um, it's very funny. You, the two of you are very funny. <laughs> you especially make me laugh. Uh, and when I listen to your podcast, in a way, Dirk, it almost sounds like two podcasts in one because you're doing your debate and then you have a little conversation a little bit of fun with with sebastian and and i almost like that part as much as i like the debate did that just did that just organically or naturally happen yeah the, uh, so so maybe for for your listeners the setup of the podcast is as follows we have a motion yes. and we decide by a flip of a coin who's arguing for and who's arguing against the motion and we do it in three rounds three minutes, two minutes, and one minute uh, rounds. And afterwards, the audience can go to the page and vote who won the debate. So that way we make sure that no one interrupts the other person. We have real arguments. 
And usually what happens if in the beginning, at least, I had so many outtakes um, when I edited the episode afterwards, where we usually took after the actual debate on discussing and uh, we, we continued with, with our motion. And so I, I said, it's, it's actually, it, it, it's too interesting to be cut out. So I put it in the end, in the, when, when already the music of the podcast plays and I had it as outtakes added to the podcast. And like you, uh, even in editing, I love that part the most. And people enjoy listening to those of the record comments, if you will, um, at, at least as much as the actual debate before that. Have you learned a lot through this show? Because, you know, podcasting is a great way to pick up new information, to learn new things. And so it's you and Sebastian. Can you tell me maybe a little about the preparation? Are you are you doing a lot of planning? Do you are these topics uh, well in advance? And is Sebastian, is he one of your teachers? Well, everyone I interact with is a teacher of mine. So right now you're a bit of a teacher to me and uh, everyone I work or or meet or talk with is giving me something. In case of that debate, um, the, the, you ask for the preparation. So what we do is we decide on the motion and we flip the coin and then we we prepare on our own. That may sometimes be that we do a whole week of reading and sometimes we are under time pressure and it's, it's a little bit more ad hoc. Um, but it, it depends on the motion and how we are interested in the in site ourselves, how deep we go. And what we learned both actually about that podcast is uh, we have to defend motions in a way that makes sense in our own value system and our own belief system. And that's very interesting. So when we initially planned for the podcast, we thought maybe it's just easy to you pick the arguments for and against the side and who cares you you can present that in any way but it turned out that we both need to find ways even if we land on a side that wouldn't have been our natural choice um, we then try to make like a lawyer arguments that really make sense for us and hopefully the audience because we want to win the audience and we want to be in line with what we personally believe is uh, the right value to look at the world and this was very interesting to learn. Um, and yeah, we learned a hell lot about how to bring forward arguments, how the, the other person thinks the discussion after the debate is almost as interesting for us as the actual debate, because we then usually go a step deeper. And um, Sebastian and I both had moments where we actually changed our natural position after our debate, like um, our, after we prepared for a debate, because we we learned that the other side that we didn't pay as much attention to earlier before we had to prepare for the debate actually had pretty convincing arguments. So it's an it's a learning journey from start to finish so far. I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but do you recall like one specific thing that in a belief that was completely altered through through this show? Um, a belief that was completely altered uh, was, uh, for instance, um, in in the debate um, that share, we had one debate that was um, about the motion that share economy is a scam, and mm -hmm. I was very much uh, in favor of share economy. And share economy, for those who don't know the term, is basically um, the kind of uh, service that you get through Uber or Airbnb, where you basically have a good and you try to share it with as many others as possible. And there is a spectrum out there. There are companies that try to make money out of that. And there are um, very idealistic community kind of uh, services out there. And we were preparing for that debate. And I thought in the beginning, I would end up being a solid supporter of the whole idea of share economy because it just sounds so perfect. And I think I even defended that position in that debate, if I remember correctly. But after the debate, I continued doing quite a lot of reading. And well, I am I changed my position by now. I'm way more skeptical about uh, the, the kind of setup that those companies pick. Because I think there is a price to pay and the price is just not as obvious if you look at it on the surface. But there is a price to pay. I'm not convinced that it's really completely worth paying. Do you find that because there's a, it increases some skepticism that it makes you a little unhappier? No, not at all. Not at all. I, mm. I, enjoy, I enjoy checking in on things and I like to have the the personal feeling that um, that 
things can be solved by argumentation, discussion, and thinking through them. And uh, to the contrary, actually, I have a problem when people are insisting on their standpoint and their position without even considering that the opposite side may have a valid argument. argument. So um, whenever I enter a discussion, I actually try to enter it in a frame of mind that wants to be convinced. So even if I have a strong opinion of my own, I want to be convinced by the better argument or at least... I like to enter the discussion in the frame of mind that allows for that possibility. And this is something I, I cherish a lot and I like to have in my life. And this debate is an expression of that, uh, this Excellent. podcast, of course. I'm, I'm glad you answered that way because you would have crushed me if you would have said, yes, podcasting, this portion of podcasting makes me unhappy. I'm, I'm really glad you, <laughs> you answered that way. Uh, how about engagement? Because I was on todebate.net and people can actually vote. Yeah. And you even, I even notice a spreadsheet. <laughs> like you're taking, you're taking a score. C can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we wanted to make it a bit of a game. So it's uh, Sebastian and I battling it against each other. And that means somebody can win this thing. And we want to have that in a way that you can take score and look at it so we added to the web page the option that you can go to the vote uh, to the debating um, segment of the page and you can actually cast a vote and let us know which side in your uh, opinion had the better arguments we also have uh, discussion outlets uh, we are on facebook on reddit on on uh, um, Google+, Plus, um, on Twitter, what have you, with the idea that people can engage with us if they feel that way and continue the debate if they want to. And uh, the dashboard is actually a good way for us to also get a feel for um, how we are doing, how we are progressing in our journey through that podcast. So is it, for instance, uh, the case that we are more likely to win when we have the chance to debate first? Or is it that we are better in the pro or con side of the argument? These kind of things become very visible in the dashboard. And that's just an added fun element for us and our audience that at some point was so easy to create after you started collecting those votes. It was a low-hanging fruit to, to add that to the, to the whole project. And how about your debating skills? Have, have they? Can I assume that they've improved for both you and Sebastian? I very much hope that this is the case. I have a hard time judging that myself, um, but I think so. Yeah, it's uh, definitely you appreciate certain, um, let's say, ways to formulate arguments better and you discover what makes you uneasy and where you can take things in the direction you like them to go. So uh, this is definitely an, an outcome of the podcast. Another one is that we become, we became gradually more structured in how we answer. So actually Sebastian is taking a ton of notes while I bring forward my arguments <laughs> and I draw a lot. Um, and he's also, he's like drawing a little flow chart of my argument while I make it, which always uh, makes me uneasy because it makes me feel like he's so much more control uh, in control of the actual debate than me. Um, but uh, yeah, I think over the time we, we, we do that for a year now, it's uh, 31 debates online and I think we have like seven or eight in the backlog. Um, so over the, over that year, we definitely, I like to believe got better in debating and having, um, respectful arguments, even with people that, where we massively disagree with. You mentioned that you were friends with Sebastian prior to the podcast. How has your relationship changed doing to debate with Sebastian? Um, actually that's not completely accurate. Um, Sebastian and I were co-workers before that. And uh, okay. it was on a on a meeting that we had uh, for work where we where we uh, found ourselves um, sharing lunch, and uh, he he talked with me about the idea of doing something around debating on on YouTube maybe or something like that. And I was at the time already deeply uh, podcast enthusiastic. I said, "Hey, how about we do a podcast for a while?" And uh, for for us, that was the segue into the friendship. Um, we got to know each other quite well. Um, we we have a regular call every week or so just for that podcast. And um, when we when we now meet for work, it's at least partially also always around 
podcasting as well. So that that gave us a totally new layer and a whole uh, additional layer on top of the relationship we had in work. Wow, that's wonderful. Because when I listen to you both, you sound like old friends. Yeah, it feels very much that way now. I'm, I'm glad I I started that project with him because I I can safely say that's my favorite project so far, and uh, it's it gave me a really deep connection with Sebastian that I doubt otherwise would have had a chance to to build up. Wonderful, and it hasn't had has it had any effect on work. Well, at least we we know each other better now. We know each other's <laughs> work style better now. So I I yeah. suppose we. We are more effective collaborating. Um, people at work discovered our podcast at some point and enjoy listening to that or sometimes tease us about motions that we had and positions we took. So, yeah, I think it's a positive outlet for us. Excellent. So how do you find scheduling? Because you're very busy. I know you have children and, and you're working. How is scheduling? How is getting it all together? Yeah, both Sebastian and I travel quite a bit and both Sebastian and I are used to having video conferences, online conferences. So most of our recording actually happens while either I or he is traveling and one of us is always at least in some hotel room when we record. And uh, we just combine that with our regular rhythm of things. Uh, we, we are an international company, so we have international calls at off hours anyway. And we just slip one call for our podcast in every week. That's the whole magic to it. There's nothing more fancy than that. Do you have any future aspirations for this program? I would love to get people more active. Um, I do have, we do have a active uh, group of listeners who go to the page and vote, and we have uh, a few that give us comments. But one idea behind that project was to promote debating online and maybe engage with people in debates around the motions more. That's why we created all these outlets. And so far, there is just not enough critical mass yet. So we have a couple of hundred listeners, but we have usually votes in the single digits. And we are proud of every one of them, but I would love to see more activity going on. And that's uh, definitely the, the, the project um, for next year to grow the, pro the, the, uh, the podcast far enough that people feel safe in numbers and speak up and debate in a friendly way. Um, because, um, yeah, uh, it, it becomes more beautiful the more people openly engage in that form of back and forth as we do um, and share it maybe even broader. And that's another way we, we try to build a way to share these um, arguments we make and document these arguments more easily. So we try a number of services um, at the moment that are designed to, to capture um, arguments for and against motions. There are actually a couple of web services that try to do that. And we try to find a, one with a nice visualization that makes it easy to share the essence of our debates. So these are things that we hope to do with the podcast going forward in the next couple of months. Excellent. And when I was on the website, Dirk, I noticed that in your podcast player, you there is a tab there where you can have people vote, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down. Did did you create that yourself? Yeah, that's a little JavaScript thingy that I wrote. And in oh, the back end, awesome. it's just a Google spreadsheet. So everything ends up uh, in a Google spreadsheet. That's the back end for our little dashboard that we use. Wow, that's pretty cool. Now, you mentioned one of the one of it sounded like an intention was to promote debate. Did you have any other intentions behind this podcast? Yeah, I'm considering myself a bit of a podcast uh, activist. Also, I study podcasting as a method, as a medium, personally. And I'm very active in the German podcasting scene. So for me, it was very interesting to break free from the German podcasting scene and try how it is to have a podcast in the English-speaking um, audience that is listened to in the US, in Canada, in the UK, and what have you. And being a member of that community uh, was an interesting experiment as well. That was an additional aspect for me because um, I, also, I, I also was at Podcast Movement this year and comparing 
German community conferences and German podcasts and German podcasters with, for instance, US podcasters and conferences. Uh, it's very interesting and fascinating to see how they are sometimes similar and some some other aspects are totally different. And for me, it was uh, one of the personal learning um the, one of the personal um, objectives to to learn more about how it is to be a podcast in that scene and it is very very interesting to to add and contribute and network in that scene prior to going live on the show we were talking a little bit and you mentioned that you had you have three podcasts you have a tripod <laughs> i like to say <laughs> so you have a tripod uh so tell us, can you tell me, tell me a little bit more about your, your two other programs? Yeah, I have one podcast, uh, but the other, first off, the other podcasts are German. So um, it's uh, probably, uh, those are podcasts not everyone can listen to in your audience. Um, the, the My signature podcast is a daily show. Um, it's called Anerzelt, which is a, a uh, word play. Uh, it basically takes the episode number. Right now I'm f at 570 or something like that. It takes wow. the episode number as an inspiration to come up with a topic. So um, an example would be at 150 I talked about skyscrapers because there is a norm that says um, until 150 meters it's not called a skyscraper, it's just a high house. And from 150 meters rooftop uh, on it's actually a skyscraper and that has all all sorts of uh, legal implications. So that, as an example, at episode 11, I talked about soccer, of course. Um, and we had an episode where I was uh, performing a little little uh, audio play. And it's always it always starts with inspiration from the episode number. Um, it's always like five to 10 minutes and a daily show. And that started similarly to, to debate with the idea in mind to have a format that's not there yet. And secondly, give me an opportunity to grow my skill and learn. And um, my, my thought was, if I want to become a better podcaster fast, I have to do it as often as possible. So daily would be a good rhythm. And that's how, how that one started out. And the what? other podcast is a travel show. A friend of mine was taking on a one-year world trip um, he tr he hoped to find a little bit more about what his uh, aspirations are, what his dreams and goals in life should be, and uh, want to see a little bit of the world um, while he's at it. And I I thought that's so interesting that I really would love to go with him. But uh, on the other hand, uh, as you said, I have family, I have uh, I have a job. I actually like my life as it is, so I don't want to break everything down to go on a one-year world trip. So I said, how about we do a podcast? That way I'm a little bit with you. And that was um, like an interview show. Um, I did once a month an interview with him. And he, he t talked me through what he experienced and thoughts he had. And that was the other podcast. That's actually my first podcast project I had. So you have a, a monthly podcast, a weekly podcast, and a daily podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you right? can put wow. it that way. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and what's your time management secret? Um, procrastination. So whenever <laughs> whenever I feel the urge to procrastinate, I move on to something else that's in in essence is productive. So I I do I do like to study things. But as you know, if you study something and you have to write paper, sometimes writing paper can be one of the things you try to put off. So, and, and sports is another example of this. And so usually what, uh, whatever I do, when, when I feel like, oh, I don't want to do that, I just move on to one of the other parts of my life where I do something useful and have maybe more appetite right now for it. And that's how, how I basically structure my, my entire life. When, I, when I'm in the mood to record something, I record something. When I'm in the mood to write a paper for my studies, I do that. And my job is pretty cool too. So I have a lot of stuff I like working on there as well. So usually by just shuffling through these parts of my life, um, I get a lot of things done. And it helps a lot that all my, my uh, let's say, compartments in my life are built in a way that I'm the one in charge of my, my time. So I'm setting the slot in the calendar. I'm agreeing to do something. I'm in control when I do what, and this is this is of course uh, an, a necessary requirement for this kind of system to work. That's wonderful. 
So you're in control of your life. And then when procrastination sneaks its ugly head in, you <laughs> recognize it and then you move on to something else. It's like, I know we're not talking about podcasting here, but when you get that initial impulse of procrastination, I guess that was that a, a, something that you had to learn over time to have like a trigger? Like, this is my trigger. This is what I'm going to do next. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I think it, yeah, it, it absolutely makes sense because uh, as you say that, that um, catching yourself in that moment that you start procrastinating is key, of course. And uh, if you, if you do that after you already spent an hour on YouTube, that's maybe too late. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, it, I, I guess it's something I developed over time, um, the, the sensitivity to that. It's also not that much of a consci uh, conscious, um, process, um, because I like, I like the different projects in my life so much that it comes natural to me to procrastinate with the other thing I like. So, um, when, when I'm tempted to, to drop, uh, drop out of my paper, I think to myself, Hey, just that one paragraph. And then I continue doing something for work or I go for a run or, um, I record one of my daily podcasts. So it's, it's comes naturally to me now, but I guess I had to go through the, through some learning while I was younger. You know, Dirk, I've been seeing this a little bit more lately. Maybe it's because I'm opening my eyes to it that more podcasters are doing a daily micro podcast and, and I'm, you know, five to 10 minutes or, or something really short. And I've often thought to myself, maybe I should do that because I'm always in this mindset where I want to be a better person. Like every day I need to grow. I need to grow. I need to grow. Do you find that by doing it daily that you, you have actually grown as a person? I definitely grew in, I can say, for myself, if that is uh, like a um, exercise in, in, in personality building, but I grew a lot of skill around podcasting itself. I research quite a bit for my podcasting project, so I learn a lot of interesting things. And that goes to say, um, coming back to the procrastination comment earlier, you know, instead of just going on a YouTube and Wikipedia rage, I basically do that for my podcast. So it's channeling energy I would probably spend anyway into something that is productive in the end. Um, it was a conscious decision for me to do a five to 10 minute podcast because I wanted to do a podcast that is an entry drug for <clears> others. <throat> and somebody who's not used to the space may be uh, scared off by having the, the kind of one to three hour podcast that are quite common in the German podcasting scene. And mm -hmm. also by doing a podcast only on my own, I freed myself from scheduling interviews. So I'm actually quite impressed by you uh, who has a <laughs> interview schedule to stick to and be on point for that and do a live show of all kind of shows. That's, that's, um, way more structure than I I allow myself to stick to for my daily show. So um, I think your exercise in, in personality building goes farther than mine, um, but I definitely grew by doing a daily podcast and engaging with other podcasters in the space. Dirk, uh, before we started talking on, on live here, you were mentioning a couple of projects that you were doing revolving around podcasts that sounded really interesting. Can, do you mind sharing a little bit about those? Yeah, um, I currently have two portals. Again, sorry, German portals. Uh, one is designed to attract new listeners. So that's called Podcorn, like popcorn just with pod in the beginning uh, and what i do there is i recommend individual episodes instead of having a whole feed and uh, putting the burden of understanding how to subscribe to it and follow it i basically say hey here click on play listen to it this is a beautiful piece of audio that you mm -hmm. you might enjoy and um, if you enjoyed it click here and i explain all the rest um, so that was uh, my first podcasting portal that I created and it's still alive and uh, uh, heavily used by people that want to attract new listeners and don't do the explaining themselves. And the other one is uh, my my uh, latest addition to my little podcasting zoo um, that's called Pot Palin, which is German for pot pearls. And the idea there is that I try to find podcasts or 
sequential audio on the internet that may have been pod faded or never has been properly equipped with a podcast feed in the first place, but is really too good to be just lost in the internet. Um, I surf a lot on the internet archive, for instance, and sometimes the internet archive has snapshot, snap, snapshots sorry, for all yep. podcasts, and I surface those. Um, I write a, uh, a podcast feed for that. I, I add a button on my page where you can subscribe to the whole thing or listen to it right away. And I try to basically bring out these hidden gems in the internet um, to the surface and make it available to people that look for content and may be interested in content that has been interesting already five, six years ago. And just nobody knows it anymore that it ever existed. Wow, you, there's just like no escape. <laughs> you can't even <laughs> pod fade your your show anymore. Anything you put on the internet is seems to be retrievable somehow, some way. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So most most of these things actually fade away, and yeah. um, I also I'm also very careful not to put anything in that archive that the the original creator didn't intend to be resurfaced. So I ping the people if I can, or I make sure that uh. they basically flagged it as uh, CC licensed. Um, but uh, yeah, most most things, especially audio, is actually fading away because uh, the the Internet Archive and all sorts of other services take care of video, take care of text. But audio is one of the things that just recently really uh, got attention by by these services. So um, most of the stuff out there actually disappears and fades away and no one has a chance to listen to it anymore. And I think that's a shame. I think it's a, a piece of culture that fades away here that we could preserve real people having real conversations that that might be one of the really, the, 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 the treasures of the future when people try to understand what the hell we were thinking. Yeah. It's almost like, a, almost like a global cu culture, is it not? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I, I'm really glad to hear that you're pinging people <laughs> before you're putting it on there. Because I, the first impulse that came into my mind, or th the first thought was like, "Hmm, sometimes we pod fade for a reason." So that's that's excellent that you're doing that. I uh, I tip my hat off to you, sir. Yeah. Also, um, if uh, the podcasters uh, that listen in your audience, please consider maybe if you if you decide to pod fade and. You just do it for the reason of having not the time anymore and don't want to put up with the with the lips and bill or whatever anymore. Um, please consider moving your audio to archive.org if you if you actually don't mind. Um, if if that's not the, if if you're not fade for the reason of getting getting rid of the files on the internet, that is. Um, because I, I think it's often also that people just don't know where to put the stuff um, without having an, an ongoing bill on it. And archive.org hosts your files for free. So you can put up all your podcast files there. There are actually even people hosting live podcasts on archive.org. And archive.org will probably stick around for a couple of decades at least. So um, that way you can contribute to that um, memory of our culture. Dirk, are you ready for the podcaster's nerd out one minute challenge? I don't know, but I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's pause for a moment and we'll get right to it. Well, hi there, my name's John Senior, and just to interrupt your listening of Alexander's podcast to tell you that he will be appearing on my podcast marketing summit which takes place from the 9th to the 11th of January 2018 and I've spent the last few weeks networking around the world to come up with some of the brightest and most innovative podcast speakers uh, that I could possibly find that you could possibly find and even better than that the uh, admission to the summit is totally free so if you want to get your ticket now and you should go to podcasterscoach.com forward slash summit and I'll, I'll give you a free ticket once again thanks very much and speak soon Hi, this is Stephen Pacheco, the host of Trace Evidence. My podcast is about unsolved murders and disappearances, and my aim is to bring more attention to these often overlooked cases. Check me out on iTunes or at trace-evidence.com. And now, back to the podcaster's life with Alexander Lauren, the podcaster's coach. 
All right, Dirk. The Podcaster's Nerdo Challenge. The object of the game is to answer as many questions as you can in one minute. If you're stuck, just say pass, and I'll move on to the next question. Let's see how many questions you can answer correctly. The high score is 12. Let's put 60 seconds on the clock. The clock will begin after I ask you the first question. Are you ready? Yes, let's do this. <laughs> Will SoundCloud exist in 2018? No. Is Juti a type of woman's shoe or a podcast microphone? Woman's shoe. What's the full name of your microphone? Electrowise RE320. What is the name? What is the name of the first guest you ever interviewed? Alexander. Who was the first U.S. president to podcast? Um, uh, Bush. George W. Besides your, besides yourself, name your favorite podcaster. Oh, oh there are so many. Um, <laughs> um, trying to come up with a, a pass. Who has more podcaster? Who has more podcasts, men or women? Men. Have you ever truncated silence? Yes. Do podcasters call three podcasts a tripod? <laughs> yes. On a scale of one to ten, how would you rate your first published episode? One and a half. What, podca what podcast player do you use? Um, Pocket Casts. Excellent. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Very good. Ten. Yeah, and I tried Ten. to remember names of uh, English-speaking podcasters. I could have <laughs> come up with a podfather, whatever his name is. I could have said your name. I could have said Roman Mars. I could have said Ira Glass. I could have said um, Rob Walsh. So many people. And in that moment, I blanked. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, 10 is excellent. You did excellent, my friend. Excellent. Thank you. You. What did you get wrong? I don't think you got any wrong, did you? Uh no, pot. You know what? You've got a tripod. You got full marks for that. I wasn't uh, sure about the, the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> you were right on the shoes. And uh, the first guest you interviewed was Alexander. I'm taking that. That's okay. Um, you were excellent. You but, did very well. You are today's winner. Ah, uh, thank you. But actually, it was not you. I have to say. <laughs> Oh, okay, but, it, good. but it's a good sign that the first guy I interviewed actually has the same name as the show host here, right? <laughs> yes. Very good. All right. How, uh, Dirk, thank you for playing my game. How could people hear your show and how can they connect with you? So my show is everywhere where you get your podcast from. Um, iTunes, um, Spotify, you name it. Um, it's called to debate, uh, to the number, debate the word, dot net or dot EU, both work. And um, you can find me anywhere um, on that page, on Twitter, on Facebook. I'm pretty much on all social media outlets. Looking forward to connect with you. Dirk, thanks so much for coming on the program. I was really looking forward to speaking with you. Likewise. Thank you for having me. All right. D don't go away. Don't go away. Listener, stay tuned for the bonus micro podcast improv and thank you for downloading or streaming today's live episode. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a five star ratings on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. It would be greatly appreciated. Thanks so much for your time. Have a wonderful day and goodbye for now. All right. All right. So we're still live and I got the box here. You hear that? <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Dirk? I hear that. The magic All box. Right. The magic box, which is getting very low. And I'm going to pick one out. And it's from my daughter. Perhaps it could be from my wife. And we will do a passion project micro podcast improv. And the topic is table. 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 Wonderful. <laughs> Table. <laughs> All right. Table. Welcome to the Table Micro Podcast. Alexander here, and I'm joined with my co host, Dirk. Hey, Alexander, how are you doing? How is your table? I, my table is so awesome. My table is so good, Dirk. I love tables so much that I have one stacked on top of the other as we're speaking. I absolutely adore 
tables. What say you? <laughs> I re learned recently by talking to a friend that table is not only a piece of furniture. Actually, it's also a figure of speech. And I also learned that the Brits and the Americans and Canadians mean completely different things when they say, let's table th something. Did you know that? Let me ask you, what does uh, it mean for you when, when you say, let's table that? Well, when I am using that word, let's table that, it's like I, what I'm thinking about is just placing an item. So if someone comes to me and they say, well, where should I put your hat? I say, well, let's just table that. Or if they come to me and they say, listen, I brought over some fried chicken. What should I do with it? I'll just say, let's table that. Don't they do something similar in, in Germany? I know we're not part of the Commonwealth, but how about in <laughs> Germany? <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. You actually came up with the third, the third meaning of let's table that. Um, so actually, <laughs> the two meanings my friend, who's an American, by the way, living in UK, told me is um, when the Americans say let's table that, they basically mean, yeah, let's not talk about that anymore. And oh. the Brits, when they say let's table that, they actually mean, oh, let's bring it out to the open and have a discussion over that. And you, you literally connected it to the piece of furniture that is a table. That's amazing. That may be the third missing link here, that uh, the, the Canadian culture piece. And all the, all the three of you use the exact same wording to mean completely different things. Well, you know, in Canada, we love our tables. Uh, and, and this country was, you know, based upon Christian ideas. All the Christians were here, the wonderful Christians. And I believe Jesus was the first one to come up with a table. We still <laughs> celebrate all those holidays. And dang it, Dirk, we always use tables during all wonderful. of these holidays. That also yes. means when you say, let's table something, you put the, the food on the table. When the Americans want to hide it, and uh, the the Brits just want to discuss about it. So I I guess I like the Canadian way mo mo the most. Then, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing I love about doing this micro podcast with you and podcasting in general is that I get to learn. And I, you know what, I dream about tables. Like yesterday, for example, I dreamt about a table on the beach, and I had a drink <laughs> on it, and I was like Gosh. caressing it nicely and making sure that the sand wasn't on top. Where did you initially get your love and desire for tables? I think we have the same dream. I also dream about little cocktails with umbrellas sticking in it on that mm. table, on that beach, right? Did you see that yeah. in your dream as well? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. The, 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 it was on top of it. And, uh, and it, you know, it, it was just a, a wonderful yeah. place. I just fondly looked at it. It was just love. Yeah. And uh, where do I get my love for, for tables? For L Tables always provided for me. You know, the table right now is uh, carrying my recording equipment and my computer screen. And the table um, uh, close to the kitchen carries nice food and I could put, uh, put my drinks on it and everything. So tables were always very kind to me. And and um, help me putting things somewhere. So um, that's that's where the love for tables comes from. Excellent. And I got to ask you, I don't think I've asked this to you before, but what is your favorite activity with an upside down table? I'm putting it uh, up the right way, of course. I'm German. Are you kidding me? Upside down table? <laughs> that's not a thing, is it? Oh well, in Canada, we we set we it, rather than meditation cushions, we just flip it upside down and sit in the middle, and that seems to work quite well. Listen, Dirk, <laughs> this has been wonderful. It's so nice to talk about tables with you. Why don't you take the final word? Perhaps you could let the listener know what they should in what's in store during episode two. Uh, in episode two, we're going to talk about the the different kinds of tables that you can put on the beach three leg table, tables without legs, tables with six legs. There are so many ways to have an interesting, fascinating table, high table, low table, standing table, everything. That's going to be our episode two. And episode three, we go on then and talk about things you can do while sitting in the middle of a table to meditate. So that was it. I hope you enjoyed that little interview. Again, you can find Alexander's podcast on podcasterscoach.com or on iTunes. Besides that, always love to hear from you. So don't be shy. There's Reddit, Facebook, Google+, Instagram, Twitter, 
whatever your poison is, or even email or comment on the page. We are happy to hear your feedback. And it's easy to memorize how you get there. To debate.eu slash reddit or Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or Slack or Pinterest or G+. All of these links bring you to the page where you can contact us. You get the idea. And yes, I do love my short links. Bye.